So those are the compressibility corrections we're going to use in this course. But the key question to know is when can you use these? And so we need some kind of estimate of when the Mach number somewhere on the airfoil will become supersonic and therefore especially the potential Clauert rule will break down. So this introduces the concept of critical Mach number. So remember the linearized theory was valid for m infinity less than 0 0.8 and m infinity between 1.2 and 5. Between these regions, between 0.8 and 1.2, we have transonic flow where the behavior is highly nonlinear. And what we're going to discuss is some qualitative aspects of that transonic flow here. So let's say we have an airfoil. It's initially in a low speed flow. say m infinity is 0 0.3 to start. There'll be some point on the airfoil, which we'll call A, that has the maximum Mach number of anywhere in the flow. Let's say for this airfoil it's 0.435. This is really arbitrary, but it'll allow us to continue to use some numerical values as we move forward in the discussion. So basically A is the point of minimum CP, and therefore maximum Mach number. Now as we increase m infinity, ma will also increase. So for example, if we go to 0.5, ma will go to 0.772. And at some point, if we keep going up, we're going to hit an m infinity value such that ma is 1. And so we call this critical Mach number the m infinity when ma equals 1. Here, for this example, it would turn out that the critical Mach number is 0 0.61. Now, determining this critical Mach number uh, for a given airfoil is very important because when the free stream Mach number is greater than the critical Mach number, the drag coefficient of the airfoil increases dramatically. And we'll discuss that phenomena next time. But here we're going to develop a method for estimating the critical Mach number. So let's just introduce things we're going to need. P infinity is the free stream pressure. PA is the pressure at point A on our airfoil. We know our flow is isentropic, so PT is a constant. Therefore, we can use the isentropic relations and write that PA over P infinity is PA over PT over P infinity over PT. And the isentropic relations say this is 1 plus 1 half now minus 1 and infinity squared over 1 plus 1 half gamma minus 1 ma squared all to the power of gamma over gamma minus 1. And our pressure coefficient at a is 2 over gamma m infinity squared. This is now using the non-linearized version of the pressure coefficient that we saw last time. So that CP at A, using this ratio, can be written as follows. 2 over gamma m infinity squared times 1 plus 
one half gamma minus one and infinity squared over one plus one half gamma minus one and a squared. Over gamma, over gamma minus one, all minus one. Okay. So this is a lot like a compressible flow Bernoulli equation. It relates Mach numbers and pressures throughout the flow. For a flow with constant stagnation pressure, like we have in a flow that's incompressible where we can apply Bernoulli. So what we want to know is what the value of CPA is when the Mach number at A is 1. So this brings in the concept of the critical pressure coefficient. CPCR. And this is just going to be the same expression, but where MA equal 1. So it's 2 over gamma m infinity squared. 1 plus 1 half gamma minus 1 and infinity squared over 1 plus 1 half gamma minus 1 all to the gamma over gamma minus 1 minus 1. So if the free stream Mach number equals the critical Mach number then this critical pressure coefficient will occur only at one point and that will be at point A. So if m infinity equals the critical Mach number, then CPA is CPCR. So we can put these together and get that the critical value of the pressure coefficient is 2 over gamma times the critical Mach number squared 1 plus 1 half gamma minus 1 is the critical Mach number squared over 1 plus 1 half gamma minus 1 gamma over gamma minus 1 minus 1. So what this shows us is that the critical pressure coefficient is a unique function of the critical Mach number. And this is true for any isentropic flow. We haven't even brought in anything that requires us to be an airfoil yet. So now, to constrain the problem fully, what we need to do is combine this with one of the compressibility corrections. And that allows the critical Mach number to be estimated for a given airfoil. First thing we need to do to do this process, I'll sort of outline it step by step, is obtain CP0, the low speed incompressible pressure coefficient um, at the minimum pressure point on the airfoil. So we could get this from thin airfoil theory or from numerical methods or from an experiment. Then the second step is to choose a compressibility correction and get CP as a function of M infinity. Once we have that, we need to get the intersection of the two curves. So we have CP equals the function of M infinity from our compressibility correction, and we also have CP critical equals a function of M infinity or I'm critical. And that intersection gives the critical Mach number and the critical pressure coefficient. And you can find this numerically or graphically. Now, 
Remember, this gives you only an estimate since it's relying on the use of one of these approximate compressibility corrections. But it's still very useful for preliminary design to be able to look at the incompressible flow over an airfoil and basically directly figure out what the highest Mach number which that airfoil can operate is before supersonic flow appears on the airfoil surface. And a result that you can take away from this is that thinner airfoils have less flow acceleration on their upper surface than thick airfoils, so their critical Mach number will be higher. So you'll see that high-speed aircraft generally have very thin airfoils for this region. There's an example of this given in the text uh, in section 11.6.1, .1, and we'll discuss this more in the in-class activities.